Could you maybe uh, give your side of why it was so important uh, for you to join the Galileo project aside, alongside Mr. Elizondo? Sure, I'd be delighted to. Um, obviously, the, the government doesn't have a monopoly on, on uh, science or intelligence. Uh, in fact, if anything, it's, it's more the reverse. Um, there's immense talent out there that, that would like to be involved, and it's frustrating to, to uh, know and work with people who would like to contribute, who are not able to in the scientific community. Um, I think it's very important to bridge those gaps where we can, and I'm delighted to try to play a role in facilitating that. And uh, you know, every almost every great thing is is accomplished through collaboration uh, of of people. And uh, this is a good example. I think it's a win-win for the government and the scientific community. Yes, um, especially now with uh, Senator Gillibrand uh, pulling uh, her weight or the Senate's weight, which is a very exciting news. I know you've been very vocal about that, Mr. Mellon. Uh, do you think now uh, more and more people in the Senate or in the government um, are not talking about if UAP is real, but um, how are we going to determine what it is? Um, so is... Um, your collaboration uh, with the Galileo project, is that also uh, something that is going to press the government more to invest more in UAP investigation? I'd like to think so. It's another um, activity that raises public awareness. Um, Dr. Loeb has played a critical role in that regard with his, his award-winning book, uh, staking and, and taking a very brave and, um, uh, I, you know, originally um, uh, unique position on this issue. He's been the first really to break ranks with the scientific academic community and say, this is really serious and legitimate and we need to look at it. Um, so all of these things are very helpful. And the biggest problem that we had from the outset when Lou and I approached the government was simply lack of information. Once the members of Congress began to appreciate what was really happening, once they started to the, talking to the Navy pilots and so forth, then they engaged. The, the facts, to a large extent, speak for themselves and motivate people. So generally speaking, the more that we can spread the word and share information and collaborate, the better. Very Mr. briefly, Mellon. one of the great things about the Gillibrand Amendment is that it requires continuing unclassified reports issued to the public. So if that amendment doesn't pass, there is no requirement, no demand on the executive branch to produce any more unclassified reports. The second thing is that there are already some people associated with the Galileo project who are exposed to uh, classified information but don't share it like Lou and I it's not relevant. It's not pertinent. They don't want it. We don't provide it. And Do you uh, reject it, Avi? We, we can still collaborate. I don't want it. Uh, I, I don't want my hands to be tied uh, with knowing information that could influence the way that we do the research. So, I, yes, I have one uh, more thing here on this issue, and sure. that is that I believe there's a lot of information in government channels not available to the public, which is either currently unclassified or could readily be declassified. And one of the things that we can do on that panel is help to be advocates for that and review that. I can, Lou and I have both seen things, videos that are nearly identical in every way to the ones that have been released. They're, they're not, they're, they couldn't possibly damage national security, but they haven't been released. Right. And I think there's, there's a considerable more data like that we'd like to see uh, see more of that shared with the public and the scientific community. Now, Mr. Mellon, to elaborate on that a little bit, <clears throat> of course, you have seen much more than you could ever share with uh, someone like me or Avi. Um, but um, what do you think uh, is your personal asset you're going to bring uh, to the Galileo project? Uh, what is uh, the main thing you are willing to focus on to, uh, to help this project become a huge success in pursuit of disclosure? Sure. So one of the things I can help with a bit, I think, is where to locate some of this instrumentation, where we may have ideas of where there's a considerable amount of activity. Um, thus far, early on in the process, because of the time I've spent working on this, I've been able to identify 
some other civilian groups actually that have complementary hardware or software that the group was not aware of. I've been able to bring that into the discussion. And also I have a little bit of a different perception on this issue of um, disclosure and how it might impact society. And I think Lou does too, because we've been involved with that and we've seen some of the initial steps and how people react. So uh, mostly I think my job is to help facilitate coordination and information flow. Uh, and I'm delighted to be a part of the project. Oh, great. My, uh, uh, just one more question for you, Mr. Mellon, maybe for Lu uh, you too, Lou. <clears throat> you were talking about locations, where to set up these teleco systems. Um, my question is, have you ever considered working uh, with the Hesdalen team and the locations they were uh, using? I, I'm aware of the team and the work in Norway. And, and that's great. And there's no reason there can't be information sharing, but um, that's a little far away for me. All right. Thoughts, Avi? Yeah. Well, first, I wanted to comment that in this uh, National Cathedral Forum, <clears throat> both uh, Bill Nelson and Avril Haynes were asked, what are the most exciting projects in your organization? And they said, we cannot speak about them. They are classified. Uh, gentlemen, do you think it's sufficient enough to just first for the Gal Galileo project to uh, develop uh, new camera systems or telescopes, or should they uh, work towards the five observables, maybe uh, uh, create systems that can uh, analyze signature, uh, exotic materials, uh, go uh, under the ocean, uh, see what's there, because you know the phenomenon is trans-medium, clearly. What do you guys think? Uh, you want to jump on this one first, Chris? All right. Um, okay. Well, first of all, the, the project is not limited to, to cameras. I mean, they're looking at audio data, for example. And um, I was able to uh, connect them with a, a global network that's part of an arms control monitoring system uh, that I brought to their attention that, that actually can track meteorites and bolides through audio waves. And so that's an example of data that hasn't been tapped for this purpose, hasn't been used, that's available. I think I don't think the team is blinkered by or limited to to any particular uh, kind of phenomenology, but obviously they have to, to start somewhere and, and put the uh, resources where they're most likely to be effective. And um, and I think that's exactly what they're doing. And, you know, I'll try personal perspective or professional perspective how big do you think the chances that uh, whatever the phenomenon is is it uh, is extraterrestrial and we should look at it like that also scientifically i'm reluctant to speculate first of all i mean i think what this is all about is getting more data and um, sometimes speculation can help you form hypotheses that you can test and it can be useful in that sense but um i don't know that we you know the problem is we don't have enough uh, data yet to make that determination. And uh, uh, actually, sometimes speculation can be counterproductive, uh, as it can be in this case. With regard to DOD, most of the people in the Pentagon who are involved in this do not think it's extraterrestrial. Uh, and many of them are skeptical about that, at least. And there's still, it's hard for some of them to form the words. And, and you, know, you notice they created in that report, they created the category other. They don't even have a category for yeah. extraterrestrial. So they're still having a hard time getting used to this new world. Uh, but the point is, as we, we gather and collect and analyze more data, it'll start to come into focus for all of us. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll hopefully get to the bottom of this and find the truth, whatever it may be. Is this something uh, that is important that if we have uh, knowledge on the phenomenon, we could back engineer it and possibly um, you know, enhance our technology? Absolutely, in my mind. I mean, we're seeing objects that are using some kind of propulsion system that we don't understand. It's not the, the kind of thing that we use to power virtually any other aircraft. It's not combustion uh, engineering. They're not inhaling oxygen and mixing it with fuel and igniting it. Uh, there's no air intake on a lot of these things. There's no exhaust. Uh, there's no wings. There's a lot of novel, if not radical, uh, perhaps unknown to us technology being involved there. They could 
have all, all manner of, of extraordinary benefits if we're able to emulate it and understand it. Um, so that's, that's a ways off, but that is absolutely one of the potential long-term benefits. For sure, uh, for sure. Um, uh, Mr. Mellon, can I ask you, uh, what was it that made you convinced that there's something penetrating our skies um, that shouldn't be there or we just don't know what it is? Because when I talked to uh, former Senator Reid, the first time he really took UAP seriously was when Mr. Bigelow sent him information. Now, uh, he had already access to the Blue Book files, Grudge. Um, what was it that made you convinced there's something to be investigated? Well, <clears throat> two things, really. I was participating in as a consultant in some official meetings in the Pentagon when I became aware of the extraordinary number of incidents that were occurring off the East Coast. And when I pursued that and looked into it and actually talked to some of the Navy pilots personally, there was no question in my mind that this was going on. It was extensive. It had been going on for a long time and nobody was doing anything about it. They weren't reporting it up the chain of command, much less trying to analyze it or understand it. So to me, that was a massive intelligence failure. It was totally unacceptable. It was lack of support for our, for our people. And, uh, I was determined at that point to do whatever I could to try to try to correct the problem. As, as Dr. Loeb says, Avi said, uh, it was kind of a case that the emperor's not wearing any clothes and somebody's got to stand up and say, you know, somebody's got to say that. So I became, Lou and I were running around saying that all over, you know, anywhere we could get an audience. Right. Uh, now, uh, Ms. Gillibrand is also uh, hinting towards a international collaboration on uh, UAP uh, investigation by governments, but also scientists. Um, in your time, have you ever uh, exchanged information with uh, other governments, such as France, maybe, who have a very open program to UAP uh, investigation, or might be a, maybe even adver uh, adversarial uh, uh, nations like Russia? Well. <clears throat> There, first of all, there's there's a fair bit of information sharing that's beginning to happen at a at the civilian level, an unclassified level. Lou has has visited a number of countries now in South America and in Europe uh, to start conversations and exchange information. At the official government to government level, uh, there's there's always a, some exchange of information with our allies, but very little, if any, specifically on this topic. So. You know, one we or one of our allies might say, you know, we saw something unusual in this area and it would go through normal reporting channels into the consumers. But typically this phenomenon was not reported at all, even when it was observed because of the potential effects on the careers of, of the, the people involved. Right. So um, there's been very little to date that was uh, of any value or substance, and hopefully that's going to soon change. For sure. Have you ever, uh, you said that this was a huge security, security uh, threat, um, but have there been moments that it was a direct threat to um, the United States or maybe another country? Yeah, I want to be careful about the word threat. We, we have not seen any hostility. We've not seen any aggression. It, it's not that kind of a situation. It's a situation where you wake up in the morning and you see footprints through your house and they're not yours and right. you realize there's a vulnerability there okay so you know if people are per penetrating our air defense perimeters around carrier battle groups there's something wrong <laughs> it's not it doesn't mean there's any kind of imminent hostility but that that's not really acceptable so um that's kind of the situation we're confronted with uh in some cases lately uh they've some of these actions have been fairly intrusive. Um, some of the reports in 2019 that were, were leaked to the media discussed objects that were in very close proximity to Navy ships, moving, uh, following them for hours, sort of almost buzzing around them. Uh, objects that, that seemingly wanted to provoke these ships. Um, so it's kind of curious, you know, who would be wanting to do that and why? Um, there's this focus and attention on military assets as opposed to 
other incredible human inventions and devices um, seems uh, you know a little bit concerning. Um, uh, Mr. Mellon, can I ask you, uh, what was it that made you convinced that there's something penetrating our skies um, that shouldn't be there or we just don't know what it is? Because when I talked to uh, former Senator Reid, the first time he really took UAP seriously was when Mr. Bigelow sent him information. Now, uh, he had already access to the Blue Book files, Grudge. Um, what was it that made you convinced there's something to be investigated? Well, <clears throat> two things, really. I was participating in as a consultant in some official meetings in the Pentagon when I became aware of the extraordinary number of incidents that were occurring off the East Coast. And when I pursued that and looked into it and actually talked to some of the Navy pilots personally, there was no question in my mind that this was going on. It was extensive. It had been going on for a long time and nobody was doing anything about it. They weren't reporting it up the chain of command, much less trying to analyze it or understand it. So to me, that was a massive intelligence failure. It was totally unacceptable. It was lack of support for our, for our people. And, uh, I was determined at that point to do whatever I could to try to try to correct the problem. As, as Dr. Loeb says, Avi said, uh, it was kind of a case that the emperor's not wearing any clothes and somebody's got to stand up and say, you know, somebody's got to say that. So I became, Lou and I were running around saying that all over, you know, anywhere we could get an audience. Now, uh, Ms. Gillibrand is also uh, hinting towards a international collaboration on uh, UAP uh, investigation by governments, but also scientists. Um, in your time, have you ever uh, exchanged information with uh, other governments, such as France, maybe, who have a very open program to UAP uh, investigation, or maybe uh, maybe even adver uh, adversarial uh, uh, nations like Russia? Well, <clears throat> there, first of all, there's there's a fair bit of information sharing that's beginning to happen at a at the civilian level, the unclassified level. Lou has has visited a number of countries now in South America and in Europe uh, to start conversations and exchange information. At the official government to government level, uh, there's there's always a, some exchange of information with our allies, but very little, if any, specifically on this topic. So, you know, one of, we or one of our allies might say, you know, we saw something unusual in this area and it would go through normal reporting channels into the consumers. But typically this phenomenon was not reported at all, even when it was observed because of the potential effects on the careers of, of the, the people involved. Right. So um, there's been very little to date that was uh, of any value or substance, and hopefully that's going to soon change. Um, but have there been moments that it was a direct threat to um, the United States or maybe another country? Yeah, I want to be careful about the word threat. We, we have not seen any hostility. We've not seen any aggression. It, it's not that kind of a situation. It's a situation where you wake up in the morning and you see footprints through your house and they're not yours. And right. you realize there's a vulnerability there. Okay, so... You know, if people are per penetrating our air defense perimeters around carrier battle groups, there's something wrong. <laughs> it's, it's not doesn't mean there's any kind of imminent hostility, but that, that's not really acceptable. So um, that's kind of the situation we're confronted with. Uh, in some cases lately, uh, they've some of these actions have been fairly intrusive. Um, some of the reports in 2019 that were, were leaked to the media discussed objects that were in very close proximity to Navy ships moving, uh, following them for hours, sort of almost buzzing around them, uh, objects that, that seemingly wanted to provoke these ships. Um, so it's kind of curious, you know, who would be wanting to do that and why? Um, there's this focus and attention on military assets as opposed to other incredible human inventions and devices um, seems, uh, you know, a little bit concerning. For sure. I strongly share that view. It's been mystifying to me for decades 
why the scientific community and the government have not been more interested in this phenomenon when we have hundreds of thousands of reports from around the world, from all manner of people, commercial airline pilots, the military, civilians, and so on, and scientists as well, as a matter of fact. And it is, as uh, Avi said, if any one of those is extraterrestrial, that's all it takes. <laughs> and uh, and then we're, we're in a sort of a, a, new, a new environment, a new world. It's an incredible thing. So uh, the individual incidents, uh, may have low probability, but enough incidents and enough research, we may find something that really is uh, unique and transformational. And, and, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, it's worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book. I wouldn't there ever been an effort or, or have you ever tried to combine that information and maybe even now uh, use, uh, because my feeling is this, Everything that's still classified cannot be shared with science yet. But if, like, for example, what Ms. Gillibrand is doing, and you can pile up all this information onto one central, uh, centralized uh, system, uh, it would be so much more easy, I guess, for the science uh, to compare what is ever, whatever is for, uh, uh, at hand and work with. Now, is this something you or Ms. Gillibrand are lobbying for? Well, absolutely. That's part of the intent of her amendment to to help overcome what you refer to as these different stovepipes. It's a huge problem. When 9-11 occurred in the aftermath and that was analyzed, one of the conclusions was if FBI and CIA had been sharing information, they might have been able to prevent that tragedy. Right. And so this is a very similar situation, only it's it's more extensive and worse because there are many more agencies that have relevant information not just CIA and FBI. So it's crucial from the government national security standpoint, at least, to start bringing the puzzle pieces and putting them in one room on one table and uh, putting them together. And the more of that information we can share with the scientific community as well, the better. Max, so Max uh, I stopped you before when you asked uh, Chris about last week. Maybe you want to uh, get into that. Mr. Mellon? Well, the uh, Lou, Lou and I were in uh, in D.C. Uh, most of the week uh, in support of the Gillibrand Amendment and uh, speaking in with uh, consulting with different people on the Hill and in the executive branch and trying to do whatever we could to be to be of assistance. And uh, um, we had a, we had a we had a good, meaningful time down there and we're, we're tentatively optimistic. Well, that's great. I, I, I had the feeling when I saw Miss um, Gillibrand's uh, speech a couple of weeks ago uh, that she had been um, extended some more information uh, than, uh, let's say, usual that may might have convinced her a bit more to push this. Um, could that be true by any chance, Mr. Mellon? She has some very good staff people. By the way, she, she said that uh, she will uh, get a T-shirt from uh, her children uh, of the best mom of the year. And uh, <laughs> because they are very curious about the uh, extraterrestrials. And uh, I would like to uh, uh, suggest that uh, we will also send her a T-shirt with the Galileo Project logo. Well, uh, thank you for that, Mr. Loeb, that... Uh... That is a very promising statement for the best mom of the year. So <laughs> um, now I. Well, I think all of that is, is helpful and I think it's important. Um, I will say that I followed a particular course of action very carefully with Capitol Hill, and it was primarily a discussion about national security. It wasn't a discussion about science and it wasn't a discussion about extraterrestrials. And that was very deliberate because of the stigma is so bad that these members couldn't even approach it if you didn't provide some cover, some, some defensible way for them to be able to talk about it and engage. And that's a, that's a subject that all Americans care about, is national security, and rightly so. And there's a, there's a very genuine national security component to this. So that is kind of what got the members really to engage when they met with these Navy pilots and they looked him in the eye 
and those those uh, airmen told them what their experiences had been. I would say that's in terms of effect on the members and getting them to engage. You notice Bill Nelson, the, the director of NASA, has been talking about that. That's because he was a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee when we pushed to, to get those pilots in there and have those briefings. And right, just, right, you right. know, by, by, by good luck, he is now the director of NASA, and it's obviously had a huge effect on his thinking. So I think everybody's efforts to advance the conversation and, and get the information out are helpful and contribute and positive, and I support all that. But in terms of the actual impact on the legislators, I think first and foremost, it's been the, uh, the Navy and the military and the national security argument. Well, yeah, Mr. Mellon, to elaborate on the Bill Nelson, he has actually stated, you know, this could be uh, extraterrestrial. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which, yeah. It's great. It's great. He's, he's got an open mind. It's wonderful. We need more of that. I think, it, of course, it could be extraterrestrial. I've written about that. I've written about the extraterrestrial hypothesis. I think if you look at the unclassified report that was presented from the intelligence community, that hypothesis fits the data better than any other hypothesis that I'm aware of. But, you know, that's not proof of anything. Um, sure. That's that's informed speculation. And so <laughs> what really counts is ultimately is getting the data and, and that scientists can use and uh, to really find out for certain rather than just be speculating about what's going on for the conservatives in the audience we can call it other and to you uh professionally would be a smoking gun of evidence that whatever we are noticing in the skies could be extraterrestrial and um how can we convince the biggest skeptics, because in Holland, I'm going to tell you, uh, Jens, Dutch people will only believe if there there's an alien or an extraterrestrial, if it spits in its mouth in, in his mouth and slaps him across the face. That's when a Dutch guy will believe this could be ET. How in the hell can you, uh, you know, what would be the best evidence uh, to to have to convince uh, the general public if if it would be extraterrestrial? Well, I do think that the, the, the most important goal should... Your, your comment about the Dutch people, we have a similar expression here. We say, uh, he's from Missouri. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there are a lot of people here that you're never going to convince uh, short of, of something really in, in their faces, as you, as you uh, mentioned. But uh, we don't need to do that or attempt to do that. What we need to do is convince the mainstream uh, provide data that's compelling. I think photographic data can be extremely powerful and uh, and visceral. And I also think there's other data. For example, if we release data and the scientific community is able to validate it, that shows objects entering the Earth's atmosphere and maneuvering and exiting the Earth's atmosphere, we're going to know pretty quickly whether those are ours or not. And um, I think if we're able to, you know, the scientific community is able to see that kind of data and validate it, that will start, those kinds of things will move the conversation to a whole new level. Well, I have heard that what has been observed, that they come through our atmosphere and even uh, submerge in water. Um, I don't know if it, uh, it, it hasn't been really, um, there's no data for that, I think, not, not accessible to us uh, anyway, but... Uh, would that be something, uh, you know, Avi, to be, uh, to be a smoking gun to you if you see something oh, coming through the atmosphere? 